You're live. Well, you're not live. But. Live in this life or next? Probably, or probably next. Oh, all right. Well, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer then. Father, we appreciate this time in your presence. Lord, as we look into your word, we look to you by your spirit to guide us, to open our understanding, to help us, Lord, to hear what you have to say to us this morning. And again, we thank you for we just put this time into your hands, Lord, and we just worship you. We, we just worship you, Lord, because you care for us. You've given us your word. You've given us your Holy Spirit to help us to walk upright before you. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. <clears throat> We're picking up with uh, chapter 4, verse 5. <coughs> and give me just a second here. I've continued to look at uh, different uh, things about books, I guess you could say, books about the book of Jonah and found a few more, oh, what about that type thing? And I don't believe that's what the Lord wants me to do at this point. It might be something later on. But, uh, we'll just pick up here. I think I'm supposed to share with you I started a, a new book. Actually, I started it yesterday afternoon. It's the, uh, I can't tell you the exact title, but it's the Hebrew translation of Revelation. Or it's uh, the book of Revelation. This is from the Israel Bible Center. Uh, Basically, um, the center is, um, you know, Jewish Christians, really just like the book of Acts. <clears throat> and they're looking at things from the Jewish perspective. Anyway, just a, a tidbit that um, I ran across when I started reading it yesterday. They were pointing out how all of our commentaries that we have, and actually the church, the church general understanding of the book of Revelation is all European. That uh, their position, and of course, you know, again, this is their particular bias, is that the, uh, especially the Old Testament, is always looked at from a European perspective. It's not looked at from the people that were actually there. You know, they don't take into account their culture, I mean, the, the one is actually written to. So anyway, getting back to Revelation, <clears throat> we're very familiar with the mark of the beast, so forth, you know, the, uh, the mark of the beast being taken on the hand and on the, on the forehead, right? Well, they brought out something that, it's one of those deals that for me personally, I thought, duh, why didn't I see this? Think about when we were talking about Jesus as Messiah, and we talked about his clothing. Remember about the woman with the issue of blood? And in the scripture, it basically says she touched the corner of his robe or touched his robe. Mm -hmm. And we looked into that in the Hebrew, what, what they wore, she touched, and then this is in the Hebrew Bible, she touched the tassels. Okay? You don't get that, you know, from our regular translations. And honestly, for most of us, it didn't make any difference anyway. She touched his robe. Okay, what? But she touched the tassels. She was unclean. She touched the blue tassels that the uh, devout Jewish male of that time wore. And the blue tassels designated purity. Purity before the Lord. 
Okay? <clears throat> so you mean there's something like that, right? <clears throat> Who knows what a phylactery is? Heard your name on it. Or a telephone? Yes, ma'am. It's the little box that has the scrolls in it that they either wore on their phone. They wore them where? The arm or the front, either here or on their arm or something on the forehead. On the hand and on the forehead. Now, where's the mark of the beast? On the hand or the forehead. That can't be a coincidence. No. It can't be a coincidence. And that was one of the things they brought out, and I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, why didn't I see this before? It, uh, the, the telefilm or the phylacteries, uh, some of the Jewish males, they uh, wore them just at prayer time. You know, when they go up to the temple, remember the gate beautiful, and they, uh, Peter healed that guy? He and John were going, to, they were at the temple at the time of prayer. They were Christians, but they were there at the time of prayer to worship. This is after the, you know, Jesus is gone. So, and it was good too, and I think I just lost it, Foodie. Um, the, the idea is uh, that they would wear them at that time, okay, and some more basically all the time, take them off at night or something, but they especially had them on at prayer time. Did you remember from reading in the New Testament and Book of Acts, they were pretty diligent to go at the time of prayer. There was a particular prayer time at the temple, and they were pretty particular to be there. Kind of like Jesus, he showed up at the synagogue on the Sabbath. I mean, he, he made a point to be there. So, with all of that, they, they were common. When they, somebody started talking about having something on your hand, and it actually was on the wrist, but they called it hand from, I think it's Exodus 35. Uh, and on the, you know, bind them on the, on, uh, there and on the forehead. Again, Revelation was written to the Christian Jews. And they would have, they would know exactly what was going on. This represented their devotion and obedience to God because uh, I think it was Exodus 35 said that. So they were, did it in obedience and recognition of God. So the mark of the beast, whatever that is, would embody obedience. And if you read the, the scripture there, you know, the, the number is 666, or some translations say 616. And 616 has to do with the uh, Greek manner of writing in the Hebrew. The numbers for the name come up 666, the way they look at it anyway. And, uh, but if you spell the name in the Greek form, then it's 616. But the idea is, the mark, we don't know if that's 616, or we don't know what it is, but the mark would sow obedience to the beast. But it just, it just struck me, you know, the hand and the forehead, duh. You know, I just, anyway, I got pretty excited when I read that, and I think I maybe third of the way through the first chapter, so I'm pretty excited about reading the rest of this stuff. Yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship Amen. you, Lord. And we praise, praise your Lord. name. Praise your Lord. Because your word is true and hallelujah. you're revealing it the deeper hallelujah. way to us for your purposes. Oh, oh thank you, Lord. Lord. We worship you and we magnify your name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, use us for your glory and your honor as we learn more about you, that we care about the lost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for this time and this place. Hallelujah. May your purposes be brought to pass. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. 
praise you, Lord. I like what you said by the Spirit there. One part stood out to me about as we learn more about you. And that's really what the book of Jonah is about. You know, we I've shared with you some of my frustrations about some of the commentaries making it today. And there's a lot of application today, but this was written to Israel and to Judah at the time. It's kind of like the, the thing with the mark of the beast. We don't, a lot of times, have any reference point to know actually what all they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was sharing with Donna, I was reading an old book. Well, not real old, but from the 40s. And I was sharing with her that this apartment had had a, uh, the linoleum was worn in front of the sink and stuff, but they had a new refrigerator. And it was electric. And they had the setting, it would keep the food cold. So when the police opened the door of the refrigerator, they couldn't tell how long the food had been in there because it was kept cold. I mean, who, you know, would you have thought of something like that? Because our time, we, we'd have no idea unless the power had been off. You know, I mean, we, we just, you know, something like that from the 1940s, it's not that far back, but it's not anything that we relate to today. You know, it was electric, it wasn't, it wasn't an ice box. Whatever that might happen to be, you know. Actually, I do know what it is, but you don't need to send me any ice cubes. I'm good. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So, anyway, as we look at this, we're, we're down into the nitty-gritty now. You know, we're starting, we're in chapter 4. Uh, Jonah's already had his, uh, almost in his face with God. You know, uh, well, actually, you know, I had on the board last week, I told you so. And that's really what he's telling God, what in chapter, or verse 2, I think it is. Was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? You know, for you rousted me out and sent me all over, I told you this. So let's pick it up with verse 5. Now we're down where everything has been focusing to. This is a Typical, I guess. I don't know if people have always done things like this or this, it's the way people's minds work or what, but God has given us a story. And actually, he, it was written to the Jews at that time, and it's obviously pertinent for us today. But he set the scene, and now... We're down at the end. We're coming down to the conclusion. So, we're going to read verse 5 through 8. Excuse me. Um, Pastor, would you take Exodus 34... And Grady, would you take Exodus 33? I don't think we'll get to the other two. If we get there, we'll sort that out when we get there. Okay, verses 5 through uh, Jonah chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. So the Lord God, that's uh, Jehovah Elohim, appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head, and catch this, to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about this plant. But Elohim appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, Elohim appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, 
so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. So let's <clears throat> look into this. In verse 5 there, I, I asked myself, what's he waiting for? You know, why, why is he still there? Because his ministry is over. He's, he's said the peace, and he knows, we know that from verse 1 here in chapter 4, he knows <laughs> God's not going to destroy him. That's the idea. Now, some commentaries say that it's not consecutive that uh, when he went out from the east and, and or went out to the east and so forth and built that shelter, that it was after that that he saw it wasn't going to be destroyed. I don't know. Uh, there's, you know, you can kind of look at that a lot of different ways. I don't know that it makes a lot of difference to us. Uh, he went out from the city east. you recall Nineveh set in kind of a, 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 a on some plains in, in a super large valley, about 30 miles across or so, which probably is a, a whole lot different than the Willamette Valley. That's probably 30 miles across in places up there from mountain to mountain, you know. So anyway, he went up probably on the, the hills just to the east so he could look down on it. But he's waiting. Because it says there in verse 5 <clears throat> that he sat down till he could see what would happen in the city. <clears throat> uh, you know, we could spend a lot of time speculating on that. Did he think they were going to say, okay, Jonah's gone, let's get back to business as usual. They're going to stay. Was God going to change his mind? Uh, <clears throat> and when you look at what happens in verse 6, seven and eight, maybe God caused him to stay there. Maybe there weren't any camels going back west at that point in time, you know, we don't know. But it, it's the setting, it's the setting here. And a couple of things, <clears throat> um, when I was studying uh, this passage earlier this week, I ran across a, a couple of things that give us a little bit more understanding, perhaps, of what's going on here. Uh, this is Mediterranean. We do not know the particular time of year that he's there. It talks about an east wind, which is most likely a Socorro. Out of North Africa, it gets up to 65 miles an hour, and it's full of dust. And it actually blows up over the Mediterranean and swings west, all, all the way over to Greece and Rome, or Italy, what we'd call Italy. So, and hot. And like I said, now obviously the storm isn't always, uh, and actually it seems like it's more of on the idea of what we would call a hurricane, where it's widespread. You know, it comes up, big sweep. Uh, Mediterranean temperatures in that area range from 100 to 130 in the summertime. So, we're, yeah, we're not talking, you know, and again, my understanding is that's when this Socorro blows. So, when we've got this east wind, you know, those natural things fit. It's hot, it's probably, it's summertime. You know, if there were snow there, he's not building the shelter to keep the sun off. Right. So, well, and, well, yes ma'am? Why in, in, in verse 5 there, it says he makes a shelter? Yeah. Okay, so he's already protected from the sun. So why did God make this plant for shelter from the sun? That's a good point. I don't know what he because he's already got shelter. He, he does. And... I did not look up what that word shelter meant. It could be, and, and I'm speculating, okay? It could be the word that's used for the booth. 
like in the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, that's Feast of Booths, actually, and it's, uh, you, you gather some uh, limbs and stuff and just kind of make yourself a little... Uh, yeah, yeah. And so, with that, you would have the sun deflected, but you wouldn't have any relief from the heat. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Uh, I gather, and again, this this is not actual fact, what I'm saying now, but I gather uh, it's not a continual breeze. You know, we're not close, he's not close to water. He's, you know, on the side of this valley, like you say, maybe the Willamette Valley, he's on the side of it looking down, like we would go up there and <coughs> look down on Eugene, perhaps. Okay. It's still 100, you know, and in a basin like that, the uh, heat's going to set. Now, with the plant, he's going to have some, there's going to be a cooling effect because of evaporation from the leaves. A medium, uh, let's see, remember my forestry, <clears throat> I think it's a medium to large shade tree, maple, uh, maybe sycamore, uh, <clears throat> that type of tree. In the summertime at a hundred degree temperature, the evaporation of moisture from the leaves, the cooling effect is equivalent to 10 air conditioners, window air conditioners. If you think about it, you move into shade under a tree, it's not just that you're, you don't have the sun on you, I mean that's a big plus, but there's actually a cooling effect from the evaporation. So when the plant comes, <clears throat> it can drop the temperature as much as 10 degrees because of the evaporation <laughs> from the leaves, you know, the moisture evaporating that cools and so forth. Okay. Well, let's look at this. <clears throat> He's waiting. Now, let's look at Jehovah Elohim and Jonah. In verse, <clears throat> we'll go to the verse 6. And, well, 6 through 8. Now, you look at that, and God, Elohim, assigns or appoints the plant. And you know, as I drew your attention to the fact that the plant was to deliver him from his discomfort. I mean, he's got some shade, but it's still 100 to 130 degrees out there in daytime. But the plant is to deliver him from his discomfort. And God assigned that in the same way that he assigned the fish that swallowed Jonah. And then, then what happens? God assigns a worm. And once the sun gets up, God assigns this east wind. And some translations say a hot east wind, and that's where uh, some scholars think that, okay, this is that Socorro coming out of North Africa, because it's just, you know, big, you know, it's dust and so on, hot and high winds. <clears throat> and we know that from our experience here through the last few summers, it can be hot and it can be dry, and then you add wind to it, a 20 mile an hour wind, things really dry out then because it accelerates that. It makes the, you know, the heat worse, basically. It dries you out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So, <coughs> From looking at this, let's look at uh, verse 6 now. So Jehovah Elohim appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And I, like Alma brought out, he already had some kind of shade, but this is going to give him some cool, from my perspective anyway. And because it's going to help his discomfort. You know, he's there, it's hot, 
miserable. And, and what, and this is, a, I think this is fairly important here. Jonah sat down, he built himself a shelter of some sort, and he sat down to see what's going to happen to Nineveh. Where, at this point now, at this point, before the plant, where is Jonah's focus? That's not rhetorical. Where's Jonah's focus? In the city. In the city. Right, right. And is he still angry? Yep. Yeah, he is. So he's sitting up there, and again, I, I'm using the idea that he's on a little bit of a rise, small hill, whatever, looking down. That's, that's speculation. But he's brooding, isn't he? I mean, he's sulking, he's mad. He was so mad, you know, Lord, take me. I don't want any of this. So, he's here, and his focus is on Nineveh. <coughs> and, doggone thing's still there, you know. I don't see any of this fire and brimstone like Sodom and Gomorrah, because he'd have been familiar with that stuff. You know, God wiping out Canaanite cities and so on. Uh, <coughs> it's still there. So now, if you stay with me here, now a plant comes. God caused a plant to grow up. <coughs> what does it say in verse 6? Where is Jonah's attention now? And what is his mood? Yes. On the provision God provided for him, and he's happy. Right. He's happy. Yeah. Right. He's not sitting there sulking anymore. He's been distracted. And this is the word the Lord just kept bringing to me when I was meditating on that this particular these verses. Jonah is now distracted. He's not sitting there sulking, glaring down on Nineveh. Now, you know what's this is pretty nice. Wow, you know, 10 degrees cooler or whatever. You know, this, wow. All right. So his mood changes and his focus changes. His focus is on the fact that, oh, this is pretty nice. Yeah. He's not focused on the end of it at this point. And I think... How long was he sitting there before this plant grew? Because that just doesn't... You know, so he had to be there a while <coughs> watching that city, and then the plant was there. So it's going to take that plant maybe a year or two to grow. But now with God, it could be overnight. But I yeah. <laughs> now, that, and that is an excellent question because if you read that closely, when God says, you know, you're that plant, you didn't do anything to make that plant. You know, I mean, that's not your garden or anything. Mm -hmm. He says in there, and it bears it out in the Hebrew, it came up overnight. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it says there, you know, at the dawn, there came this worm. Now, the idea there is, that's a pretty short time. Now, how long mm -hmm. he been sitting there and stuff? I don't know. <clears throat> you know, there, there's nothing to show us. But he was long <clears throat> enough that he was uncomfortable. And, you know, if you think about, think about it yourself, <clears throat> if you're, well, you're not feeling good, you know, you're, you're upset about something, <clears throat> and then you, you know, you're outside in the heat, you know, in August or whatever, does that intensify your irritation, or does it lessen it? <clears throat> it intensifies it, doesn't it? You know, it, now I'm out here to this, you know. You know, you, you just it, it it makes you more angry. And judging from what Jonah's saying, you wouldn't hardly think he could get any more angry without having a heart attack or something, you know, because he's burned with anger. And it could be that this all fits together at the same time. That the idea that he's talking to God about it, it could be after he built the the shelter. And <clears throat> excuse me. And he's there, 
<coughs> meditating on the fact that I don't see any fire and brimstone. You know, Lord, where are you? So we look at that, and that plant, so I guess basically back to your question, Alma, we have no idea. <coughs> we have no idea. It, it certainly could have been, and I would imagine, and again, this is this is just me imagining. Okay. Mine don't say that it grew overnight. It just says that it grew. But right. then the, after it had grown, then that worm came and destroyed it right. the next day after it had grown. So it, it, could, it could have been there a long time. I would be angry too. Yeah. And if you look at verse 10, God says it came up overnight. It's, now what, you know, is that a literal overnight, or is this, you know, maybe it's a plant that does take a year to develop full, and it did this in a week, a month. You know, we don't know. But it's something God, it's not a special plant. We looked, you know, when we talked about the big fish that swallowed John, jo Jonah, it wasn't a special fish. It was one that existed, and God said, you go here, this is what you're going to do. And that's the same wording that's used for the plant, and for the worm, and for the wind. It's like, that's one reason the, a lot of scholars, some scholars, think it's that Socorro wind, because it's something that was calm. But the timing, <coughs> like the fish, and people have been swallowed by certain fish, the white shark and stuff. But you have one at the right place, the right time for Jonah. Now you're talking something a little more special. And after the, you know, the plant died, then here comes this wind. So we have Jonah distracted. He's refocused now from Nineveh. And I, because I kept looking at that thinking, Lord, you know, you, you've sent the plant for his discomfort. I mean, it's it's still hot there. He's still uncomfortable for whatever reason. And since the plant provided him shade, I would think that his discomfort had to do with heat. And, you know, because like you said, he's already got some shade. He certainly couldn't build a very good shelter if he didn't have some kind of roof to keep the sun off, you know. What's the point there? Um, Okay, so he's he, first thing the Lord's done, he's distracted. And I know there's a lot of things here that I don't see. I'm not trying to say that's the only thing that happened. God works on so many levels. I don't believe it's possible for us to discern all of them. But this is what I have seen, what he's, he's shown me. He's got Jonah distracted now. So his attention is off then of so now what happens next? We got the worm. And then the plant goes bye-bye. And with the plant going bye-bye, here's this hot wind. Here's this east wind. Now, it, and again, think about this. Uh, when the sun came, verse uh, 8, when the sun came up, God appointed or assigned a scorching east wind. And I know our translations have different wording in there. But east wind, I think, is pretty <laughs> consistent. So the people of that time would know what an east wind is. Okay. Kind of like if you're on the plains of, of this country, <clears throat> and in the northern, north central part, and you have a northern wind in the wintertime, you know, northern or northerly. Well, that's got a very special meaning for those people. The northerly wind for us isn't near as significant. But that's, you know, and again, they would, they would understand that. So, you know, what happened after the, the wind and the sun? He became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. Now he's back to, he, he, we, we don't have that extremely happy anymore. He's back to being pretty upset. 
But notice, he's upset about something different. He's not upset about Nineveh now. He's upset about something different. God has got him from Nineveh to the plant now to the heat and stuff. Now he's focused on himself. You know, actually, the plant got him doing that, got his attention off of that. So now he's focused on himself. Now, God provided the relief. God provided the plant. And God provided the discomfort. He had a purpose for that. And this is where a person gets challenged with how we think about God. In general, particularly, and I guess I'm going to step out here and say a person that's not as mature tends to see that if God is good, that everything is pleasant. If God is good, then my whole perception, my world, is like I want it to be. <clears throat> because if God's good, then I get what I want. I mean, that, you know, that's a, that's a common perception. It's certainly one I've had in my younger years. But that's, you know, so he provided that for a reason. So then we go to uh, Matt here. Okay, so he's got him distracted. Nineveh's not the important thing now. Now he's thinking about his own comfort. And as we look at this, you know, we're getting toward the end. We're going to go to uh, 9, 10, and 11 here in the, in the GIF. But at this point, where's the devil? Where's the devil? Now, in the book of Job, we know the part that the devil played because it was spelled out for us. Do you see any indication the devil's involved in this? Anywhere. And that, that's something, you know, and again, I, I just keep finding layers and layers for me personally that uh, I'm thinking, huh, there's no devil in this. So it's really, if, if there's not a, a, a devil in it, it's really exclusively about God and Jonah. Mm -hmm. Honestly, yeah. the sailors and Nineveh are almost a by, a by thing, you know? I mean, and we do see a lot with Nineveh as far as God's relenting of judgment. But you look at this, these verses right here, six through eight, or five through eight, that tells us an awful lot about God. These, these things are happening to Jonah. And there's no appearance of the devil in there at all. So, if we believe that God is good, <coughs> if we believe that he has our best interest at heart, then what's he doing with Jonah? You know, you see what I'm saying here? A lot of times, and we're going to get into that deeper when we get into the summary, but God's got a reason for this. And he's putting Jonah through the ringer. Is he doing this as punishment? Is he punishing Jonah? No. He's just why, why do you say that? Um... Now, I'm not saying you're wrong. Actually, I agree with you. Something. But we need to know, you know, why are we thinking this? Or something, but I think he's trying to discipline Jonah. There's a difference between punishment. Absolutely. And a lot of times punishment is done in anger. Or something right. we've done. Yeah. And right. God's just trying to discipline Jonah and get him to see from his perspective a little bit of who God is and God's nature. Oh, I like that. You know, when you, you began with that, or, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, God's focus there, I was immediately 
reminded of Hebrews where it says endure hardship as discipline for God disciplines his sons now that doesn't say you're God's son and he's going to give you a pony for your birthday that's not what it's saying at all our heavenly father I mean our earthly fathers disciplined us for our good and our heavenly father the parallel is there for our, you know, actually partly uh, earthly good, but for our spiritual good. That was a real good lead in, Janice. And you know, like I said, I, I never, I haven't connected that to the Lord just dropped it in my mind right now. So we've got a person here that seems to me like that at this point in time, you know, verses 5 through 8, he would just plug right into God disciplining us for our good, to make us mature, to grow us. <clears throat> and we look at that, and, and again, this is, I think, where maturity comes in, because you've probably met people like, well, I'm sure you have met people like I have, that things aren't going right, but why is God doing this to me? And you know, sometimes it's consequences of their own actions. And other times it may be something like this or whatever. Um, so let's, let's move down just a little bit. We don't, we don't see the devil. We see God dealing with the person. And that, uh, like I said, that passage in, in Hebrews really, to me, really resonates with this. Excuse me. So let's read 9 through 11. Um, find my place here. Okay, Jonah chapter 4, verse 9. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, excuse me here, God, uh, Elohim said to Jonah, uh, verse 10, Then Jehovah said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. And actually the literal uh, Hebrew there is came up a son of the night, perished a son of the day. I believe that, or oh, uh, perished a son of the night, excuse me. Okay. Anyway, the translation come up overnight, perished overnight. Verse 11, should I, I, God, should I not have compassion on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. So let's look at this here. In verse 9, God's very pointed with this, just like he was back in uh, the other times when he was angry, like in uh, verse 1. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 1. So here we, <clears throat> we have good reason to be angry about the plan. Now, again, keep in mind at this point, Nineveh it is not in the picture. It's the plant. It's the discomfort. It's that doggone wind. You know, I mean, that's, that's where Jonah's at. God's got him off of Nineveh. And then... And, and again, that uh, in my translation, angry even to death, you know, you just can't get any madder than that. Again, it's that stomping your feet and foaming at the mouth type thing. Now, in verse 10 and 11, God kind of sums the whole book up here. In verse 10, he says, <clears throat> you know, you had compassion on the plant. Remember, he was he was uh, extremely happy there in verse six. Extremely happy about the plant. Now the plant's gone. Now he's extremely angry. 
And the Lord Jehovah there is pointing out, you know, you're this upset over the plant. Now since his attention's off of Nineveh, God brings Nineveh back in. There in verse 10, or 11. So you didn't do anything for that plant, but you're just plum tickled with it. It's gone. You're, you know, you're burning with anger again. <clears throat> and then verse 11, God, he says, should I not have compassion on Nineveh? Why, why shouldn't I have compassion on Nineveh? And, and look at that. Well, let me let me back up before we, I get deeper. Uh, address a, a couple of things. Uh, knowing the right hand from the left, you got 120,000, more than 120,000 people who don't know <clears throat> between the right hand and the left. A lot of scholars have got a lot of opinions on that. The one that makes sense to me, and I'll, I'll explain why I lean this way in a minute. But think about your children. What age were they when they learned this is my left, this is my right? I know some adults that don't know that, but in general, you know, the younger ones. <clears throat> so I personally tend with that argument or interpretation that these were children. Children so young there's no way you could consider them to be evil or good. They're innocent. They don't know the difference between their right and their left. You know, they're, they're babes. Now, if you look at that from that perspective, and the animals, he's bringing Nineveh back in to the conversation with Jonah. But he's bringing it back in not with the adults, and again, this is why I, I went with the, the children aspect. He's bringing it back in. Jonah, there's all these kids there. They're not good or bad. There's all these kids. And what about the animals? How much evil have they done? So, you know, you're, you've got compassion on the plant, but you think I'm bad evil to have compassion on children that are innocent, on the animals that are innocent. See, that's why I, I think it's the, the young. Because I think if he had said, well, yeah, these guys have been bad, the other guys have been bad and stuff, but you know, they repented. He didn't go there. He didn't bring that up at all. So because he's working with Jonah. Jonah's not going to hear any argument about the adults. You know, I mean, he, he doesn't have an ear to hear that. But when God says, what about the children? What, what about the toddlers, the, the infants that are, that are innocent? Shouldn't I have compassion on them? So, as we look at this, um, and his act, it, he's telling us something about um, himself. Uh, Pastor, you want to take that Exodus, or you want me to do it? I, I, I didn't. The timing was bad for you. I appreciate that. Exodus 34. Yes, please. <clears throat> Five through seven. Okay. Now, the the uh, before you start reading, the context here. This is Moses on Mount Sinai with the the stone tablets the second time. All right. He had to carve out a, a new set of tablets and take them up. That's that's the context for this. Okay, Exodus okay. 34, 5 through 7, and I'm reading it out of the Amplified. Okay. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness and truth keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will but who but who will by no means clear the guilty, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Thank you. Now, look at how God, the Lord, actually that's Jehovah, Jehovah descended. Jehovah, uh, Jehovah Elohim, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who gives so on and so on. That's how Jehovah Elohim is describing himself. So when we look at what he says here in verse 9 and, or 10 and 11, you had compassion on the plant. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? And I, I ran across this. I think it's a good statement in verse or chapter, yeah, verse 11. Isn't God really saying, should I not be who I am? Should I not be who I am? Because I am Jehovah Elohim. I am compassionate. I am kind. I visit kindness, uh, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Keep loving kindness for thousands. Should I not be who I am? And it seemed to me to kind of sum that, sum that up pretty well. So we get down here. He, uh, the Lord, uh, Jehovah, distracts Jonah, gets his attention off of Nineveh, gets it on the plant, then he takes the plant, and because it seems to me, Jonah's got a lot of anger in him. You know, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's certainly not afraid to die. I mean, he gets angry enough that, you know, life's not worth living. So we get down here, and the Lord sets him up. He gets his mind off of Nineveh, Sets him up with the plant, then he takes a plant and points out, you're more concerned, you know, you're concerned about this plant that's not there. I'm concerned about 120,000 kids and so on, you know. You see the, you think this is uneven? Now, at this point, I find it interesting that, uh, and I, you probably have heard this as well, but it stops there. What happens with Jonah and stuff, we have no idea. Was this enough to wake him up? It doesn't matter because that's not the point. The point <laughs> of the whole book is, what do we see? What do we learn about God? And we see, you know, God setting things up to really reach Jonah, to show him, to show him some things here. Um, uh, let's see. In the, some Jewish writings on this, I ran across... Uh, a thought in this uh, last chapter, chapter four, it's not spelled out, but uh, let's let's talk about it. Uh, my notes say a profound thought is found in the latter part of this chapter, on chapter four. If if you cannot forgive the offenses of another, the greater sin is within you. I thought, wow, that's, yeah, I mean, it's pointed, but isn't that kind of what we need sometimes? We don't need things to be wishy-washy, well, gee, is it this or that? <clears throat> if you can't forgive the offense of another, the greater sin is in you. Yes. Well, that's pretty profound, isn't it? Yes. Pretty profound. All right. And the book stops there. We do not know Actually, it's been interesting. I would say probably at least 25 to 30 percent of the commentaries I've looked at, books and all that kind of stuff, say Jonah learned his lesson. 
We don't know that. It doesn't tell us that. It's kind of like Jonah swallowed by a whale. You know, it's not there, but people put things in. And I, as I shared with you, I tend to put Jonah on a little hill to the east. That's not in there. Uh, so, we've got about five minutes. Next week, we are going to wrap up Jonah. We're going to do a summary. What did you see? What did you learn? Yeah, learn past tense. Okay, that's good. Uh, and we're going to do some applications. And the applications the Lord gave me on this, uh, for me, were pretty challenging. Because if this doesn't have, if, if the book of Jonah, if it's just a story for us, then it hasn't done us any good. If, if we don't learn something, if we don't see something we can apply in our lives. So we're going to look at that next week. So be thinking about the book of Jonah. What, what did you see in there? What did you learn in there? <coughs> I've got several things that came out to me. I'm sure you're going to have some things that you saw, that you learned, that I didn't. And that's one reason, again, you're like a Bible study deal. You learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Oh, I never thought of that. You know, kind of like when Janice was sharing, and the Lord brought that Hebrews passage into me about, you know, consider hardship as training by the Lord. Right. You know, I mean, that's uh, pretty relevant. Any thoughts? Input? Okay, we will pick that up, and so we're good. Mm -hmm.